Chapter seven, center stage. For many days, the Hatfords and the Malloys didn't see much of each other. It was almost too hot to go outside. Eddie's baseball games, which were keeping the girls there till the end of summer, almost fizzled because the players were so exhausted by the heat. People stayed in their air-conditioned houses or went to the movies or the pool. Beth spent her days at the library working on her short fantasy story about the make-believe Shawnee Indians and helping to shelve books in her spare time. Whenever the girls were home, there was packing to do, and slowly the drawers and closets were emptying as more and more boxes piled up in the living room, ready for the movers. It was depressing, Caroline thought. Twice she had crept into the elementary school when only the custodian was around and had gone into the empty auditorium and up on the stage, where she re recited very softly, but very most dramatic gesture she could think of, the scene for a play or a story of her own. What she had to do before she left Buckman, she told herself, was recite the poem The Raven from the stage, the whole thing. A few weeks earlier, she had done an internet search for her name, Caroline Lenore Malloy, wondering if anyone anywhere might know of her. If a newspaper might have picked up the story of her being carried down the Buckman River, for example, the day she fell in. With trembling fingers, she had typed her name, and she had gotten 34 pages of references. The only problem was that none of them said Caroline Lenore Malloy. They only said Caroline or Lenore or Malloy. But one of those hits, The Raven, a poem by Edgar Allan Poe with the name Lenore in it. Sorrow for the lost Lenore. Lenore was not a common name. In fact, Caroline had never heard of a single other person with that name. It was this that made her decide she simply had to memorize that poem. And she had memorized it. She had to recite it somewhere on stage. When she found the poem in the library, however, she was discouraged by how long it was. So far, she had only memorized the first two stanzas, but she was working on it. She had to be careful when she slipped into the school. It wasn't allowed for one thing. None of the students were allowed inside the building until September. Once in a while, she knew the principal came by, but usually only the custodian was there working, tightening door handles and painting a wall. Caroline would sit in a swing or climb on the monkey bars or on the playground until she was sure the custodian was working in another part of the building far from the auditorium. Then she would slip through the unlocked door, creep down the hall of the auditorium, and enter the cool darkness of the wonderful room. Now on this particular morning, so close to moving day, Caroline knew she was going on stage in Buckman for the very last time. She walked down the long sloping aisle of the foot of the stage and climbed the four steps. She stood looking upward, entranced by the various ropes and pulleys. Everything looked very old and very used, and she could hardly bear the thought that the next time the big curtain was opened and closed, she would not be here with the spotlight shining on her. No matter, this was Caroline's day, and slowly with style and grace, she moved to center stage. In a soft voice, she addressed the empty seats in front of her. I would like to recite a little bit of The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe, she said, clasping her hands in front of her. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weary, weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. Caroline was good at memorizing. She was precocious, of course, so she could remember a lot. But things like the multiplication table were lowest on her priority list. In particular, poems with her name in them was number one. While I nodded nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Tis some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this and nothing more. As Caroline went on, her words echoed in the empty auditorium. She let her voice soar. Ah, distinctly I remember it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. And now came the part with her name in it, the name of the beautiful girl Lenore, whom Poe was writing about, who had died young and would be in his heart forever. At that moment, however, Caroline saw the custodian start to pass the auditorium door and then stop. She had an audience. Someone was listening to her. She knew that at any moment he would ask what she was doing here, how she had gotten in, and he would demand she leave. So she had to make good use of the time. At her middle name, Lenore, she decided she would fall into a faint on the stage. She would expire right in front of her audience, an audience of one, and would pull the curtain closed at the same time, a finer, more dramatic finish. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow from my book's surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore. 
Her eyes began to close as her hand grabbed for the rope to pull the curtain. For the rare and radiant maiden, whom the angels name Lenore, she touched the rope and then grasped it with both of her hands and pulled with all of her strength as she let her knees collapse. Nameless here forevermore. Wham! The curtain didn't budge, but the large painted canvas backdrop of a meadow came crashing down on top of her. She was pinned to the floor with her legs and one arm caught beneath the backdrop. Ouch! She could hear running footsteps coming down the aisle. Hey, the custodian was yelling. Hey, are you all right? She closed her eyes. The footsteps were coming up the side steps now. Then they were crossing the stage. What the world? The custodian was saying, what are you doing in here? Darkness there and nothing more, she whispered. What? The custodian asked. Tis the wind and nothing more, said Caroline. Didn't you go to school here last year? The custodian asked. Quoth the raven, nevermore, said Caroline. Chapter eight, emergency. Wally was sitting on the roof of his house when he heard the siren. Josh had taken Peter and Jake and Eddie's summer baseball game. Josh had taken Peter to Jake and Eddie's summer baseball game. But Wally said if he was going to be roasted alive, he'd do it where there was a little breeze. Thank you. Besides shade from the beech tree, fell on the widow's walk, the small fenced-in patch of roof with the trap door in the middle that led to the attic. It was supposedly the place where the wives of sea captains stood, except that there was no ocean in Buckman, only the river, not more than three feet down in most places. Wally had been standing perfectly still, trying to see if he could detect the direction of the wind. Actually, it was so hot and still and humid that he couldn't feel any wind at all. It must be 110 degrees up here, he thought. He wondered if he could fry an egg on the shingles. Then he heard an ambulance coming down College Avenue and he saw it turning in farther on at the school. What could have happened at the school? Wally asked himself. Nobody was there. It was vacation. Maybe the custodian had fallen off a ladder or something. Wally quickly crawled through the trap door and climbed down the ladder of the attic. Then, he, then the stairs to the second floor, then the stairs all the way down to the first. He jumped onto his bike and was halfway up the street toward the school when he saw the ambulance pulling out of the school driveway and heading for the hospital. Wally pedaled as fast as he could for getting the heat. At last, he would have something exciting to tell the family at dinner. Nobody else seemed interested in Wally's observations on mockingbirds or wind direction, but he knew he could capture the twins' attention, at least if he could say he had chased an ambulance all the way to the hospital. It wasn't fair, and when Wally got there, he could see the two attendants wheeling somebody in on a stretcher. Wally left his bike by the door and ran inside. The attendants were heading toward a glass door farther on. Wally raced after them and found Caroline Malloy on the stretcher with her hands crossed over her chest. Caroline? Wally gasped. Wally, she said weakly, sounding as though she might cry. But before they could say any more, the glass door closed in his face. All he could think was that maybe there had been an explosion at the school and that mad bomber Bill had gotten Caroline and it was all Wally's fault for not showing the shopping list with dynamite to the police. Wally sat down on the chair in the hallway. He twisted and turned and tried to see through the glass door. He untied both shoelaces and retied them. He pulled his knees up to his chest and stretched his t-shirt over them. He listened to the names of doctors being called over the hall speaker, hurrying down to take care of Caroline. At last, a nurse came through the glass door. Wally leaped up. What happened? To whom? Caroline Malloy. I saw them bring her in. Is she a friend of yours? Yes. It, it, it wasn't dynamite, was it? Dynamite? Of course not. Something fell on her at school, and we don't get any answer at her home. Could you contact her parents for us? Something fell on her? Wally's feet felt as though they were stuck to the floor. He couldn't move. Caroline was dying and he had to go tell her mother? Hi, Mrs. Malloy. I just came to tell you that Caroline is dying. Hello, Mrs. Malloy. Your youngest daughter died. <laughs> good afternoon, Mrs. Malloy. Well, it's not a good afternoon for you anyway. In fact, it's probably the most awful afternoon of your life because something fell on Caroline at the school and I'm here to deliver the sad news that your youngest daughter is no more. She's passed on. She's deader than a doornail. No, this wouldn't do at all. The nurse was looking at him strangely. Would you possibly know where her parents are? Wally figured that Beth had gone to the baseball game to watch Eddie play, and Mrs. Moy was probably off doing errands or something. I'll see if I can find her mom, Wally said. Tell her that Caroline wasn't seriously hurt, 
but school policy is to call an ambulance if someone has an accident on the premises. We'll probably take her up to x-ray, but we can't let her go home until a parent gets here. So she wasn't dying. Wally got back on his bike and headed for the road bridge leading to Island Avenue. As he crossed the bridge, he saw Mrs. Moy's car ahead of him, just turning into the driveway of the Moy's house. Wally rode up behind her. Hello, Wally, Mrs. Moy called, getting out of the car. How are you? I'm fine, but Caroline's not. Something fell on her at the school and she's at the hospital. What? She's okay, I think, but the nurse said for me to come and get you. What happened? Why was she at the school? I don't know. I'm only the messenger, said Wally. Mrs. Moy jumped back into the car and turned around so fast that she ran over one of the boxes. Soon, the car was out of sight. Wally rode down the hill of the swinging bridge and walked his bike across. Two more days and the Malloys would be gone. If he could just lie low for two more days, 48 hours, he could stop worrying that something terrible would happen and that he would be stuck with the Malloys forever. Stranger things had happened. Suppose Mr. Malloy died of a heat stroke in Ohio and Mrs. Malloy put the girls in the car to go home for the funeral and she was so upset that the car went off the bridge and the only person who survived was Caroline. And suppose his mother said, poor Caroline, she has no one to take her in. We'll have to adopt her and she can be your little sister, Wally. She'll be moving into your room and she can bunk with Peter. Wally sort of felt sick. What if Caroline was hurt worse than the nurse thought? What if the x-ray showed that a broken bone had punctured her heart? What if she died here in Buckman and the Hatfords went to the funeral and because Wally had been in her class, he had to stand up in front of the church and say nice things about her. What if he had to tell stories <coughs> and say she was a true and loyal friend? <coughs> Wally went into the house and laid down on the couch and pulled a pillow over his head. Chapter nine. Oh no. There were no broken bones in Caroline's body, but Mrs. Moy said she almost felt like breaking somebody's neck if anybody caused her any more trouble in the next two days. She said she didn't care if Caroline wanted to be on stage more than anything else in the world. Caroline ought to have more sense than to go sneaking into the school where she shouldn't have been. And Mrs. Moy told the girl's father this when he called to tell them that Ohio was really suffering in the heat wave. No more than we are here, George. Uh, it's so hot, I'm almost afraid to let Eddie play ball. Nonetheless, she told him, and she had told the girls the moving van was coming on schedule on Wednesday. It was due at eight in the morning, and as soon as all the furniture was out, she was turning the house over to the cleaning crew to get it ready for the Benson's return. She and the girls had been invited to the Hatfords for brunch before they left town, and wasn't that nice of Mrs. Hatford? There was too much to do to even think about the Hatfords, and Caroline realized that perhaps they would see them one last time on Wednesday, and that would be that. Suddenly, after all the pranks and teasing and horseplay and fighting and laughing and swimming and walking to school together, it would all be over. Poof. Beth was certainly happy. Her fantasy story about the Shawnee Indians had won second place in the library short story contest. Eddie and Jake's team had tied for first place in summer baseball, and the league had called off the last game because of the heat. But cars were pouring into Buckman from east and west and north and south because the college was celebrating its 100th anniversary. For four days, every hotel, motel, boarding house, and bed and breakfast was full, not a single room available within 30 miles. There were very few parking spaces as well. It's a good time to be getting out of town, Ms. Moy said to the girls. If your father were still working for the college, I'd have to go to every tea and dinner and concert there was. I've never been so glad to go around in shorts and sandals as I am now. We're leaving town just in time. Caroline tried to stay out of trouble. Her mother did not need more aggravation. That was certain. The heat made everyone short-tempered and miserable, so people tended to stay indoors in air conditioning. This, of course, meant that they had more opportunity to get in each other's way. The Hatford boys did not come over, and the Malloy girls did not go over to their house. No one mentioned the old coal mine, and that was just as well. The swinging bridge between them remained deserted as the muddy river beneath it moved sluggishly downstream. Moving day arrived. The big Mayflower truck slowly backed into the driveway, and as Caroline watched from her window, three burly men got out and walked across the yard to the front door. Ready to go, Miss and Molly said. Everything's in boxes except the furniture. It was a surprise to Caroline how fast the movers worked. The couch and the dining room table went first. Then the beds were dismantled and carried out. One by one, the rooms were emptied until the girls' voices echoed around the house. The rug, the dresser, the chairs, the lamps, the chest, the boxes, boxes, boxes. And finally, the house was empty. 
Okay, lady, we'll see you in Ohio, the driver said. Be careful with my dishes, Miss Molloy told them. Some of those belong to my grandmother. We'll be as careful as if your grandmother herself was in those boxes, the driver said. Mrs. Moy and her daughters watched the big truck roll slowly down the driveway, then turn onto the road and start across the bridge. Are you ready to say goodbye to Buckman, Mrs. Moy asked? Ready to tell the boys goodbye? I don't believe, uh, I was ready to tell them goodbye the day we moved in, said Eddie. I don't believe that for one minute, her mother said. They were just walking out to the car when the cleaning crew arrived with buckets and mops and brooms and vacuum cleaners. Mrs. Moy drove the car over the bridge to the business district, then turned onto College Avenue and drove to the Hatfords. I'll bet this is the last parking space in Buckman. Did you see all those cars in town just now? This is the biggest crowd this college has ever had. It's nice of Mrs. Hatford to invite us for brunch. I doubt that we could have found a seat in any restaurant in town. Hello, Jean, Mrs. Hatford said. Come on in, girls. Tom says he's sorry he'll miss you, but he's working today, of course. Please come and sit down at the table. I know you're anxious to get on the road, but we're so glad to have a little time with you. The Hatford boys were standing awkwardly around the dining room with their arms dangling by their sides. There was a platter of donuts in the center of the table, surrounded by fruit, sausage, applesauce, and scrambled eggs. You're so nice to do this, Ellen. I'll bet we'd find a waiting line all up and down the highway. We didn't eat much breakfast, and this looks delicious. Everyone took a seat at the table. Caroline had never seen her older sister so tongue-tied. She was quiet herself, and the Hatfer boys were practically speechless. They had not had much trouble teasing and quarreling during the past year, but now that it was time for goodbyes and mother were, mothers were present, no one quite knew what to say. We're going to miss you, aren't we, Wally? Wally didn't answer. I'll miss them, said Peter. So will Jake and Josh and Wally, said mo their mother. And the girls are going to find it really boring in Ohio without the boys. The girls didn't answer. The donuts went around a second time, and so did the sausage and eggs. The boys were stuffing their faces. Mrs. Hatford was offering more juice when the phone rang. Of course, she said. Yes, yeah, she's right here. It's your husband, said Mrs. Moy. George? Mrs. Moy got to her chair and stood holding the telephone. Hello? What? Oh, no! Caroline stopped chewing and watched her mother. She was certainly looked around, worried, and... But we can't, Ms. Moy was saying. There's no place to go. Ms. Moy turned to Mrs. Hatford. George tells me there's been a massive power outage in Ohio because of the heat. The electricity has been off in our county since nine last night, and now the power company says they don't think they can get it restored for three or four days. Oh, my goodness, said Mrs. Hatford. Mrs. Moy turned to the phone again. George, every hotel is booked solid. Every motel for 50 miles or more is full. Another pause. Then Mrs. Moy spoke to her daughters. He says it would be foolish to go home. There's no electricity, no air conditioning, no traffic lights or street lights. Even supermarkets and restaurants are shutting down because there are no refrigerators. I don't know what is what we're going to do. There's only one thing to do, Jean, said Mrs. Hatford. You're simply going to stay with us. Mm.